Happy Monday, Liberty lovers. You are back here on the flagship Lions of Liberty podcast. It is Monday. I just spent 30 plus hours on a Zoom call for for the LNC meeting, uh, the LNC meeting, the LNC convention, uh, which the show is all about. And then another, you know, who knows how long I just did the show with. But before we get into that, I want to make sure you guys know about something very important. It is uh, Mikkel Thorup and Escape Artists are putting on an awesome, awesome, awesome online summit called Offshore Escape 2020. There's so many great things about this. So many great speakers. Bobby Casey, John Perkins, who's been on the show before, and even me on June 5th, I have a presentation on this thing about all I have learned over years and years of interviewing hundreds and hundreds of freedom-loving individuals. I had an awesome time putting this together. I really want you guys to see it, and the best part, the ticket is free. You can watch all this stuff completely live for completely free. All you have to do is go register. Do that over at lionsofliberty.com escape. You absolutely do not want to miss Offshore Escape 2020. <laughs> California delegate Brian McWilliams. Okay, now I'm muted. Yeah, uh, Nick, you've done a great job tonight. Honestly, I would have lost, like the last woman said, I would have lost my uh, SH. You know what? Uh, I just want to encourage people. Look, I know people have a lot to say. I know people want to get their point across. This is ridiculous. What's going on tonight is ridiculous. We've got nothing accomplished. Nothing has been done. Nothing has been achieved here. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to me. It's embarrassing to the party that I put my my name behind. And I encourage people to get shit done. Stop with this, this parliamentary nonsense. It's embarrassing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McWilliams. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here's your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. Well, that was uh, our good friend Brian McWilliams ranting at the uh, Libertarian National Convention to start things off here. I I think we probably all felt a little ranty after these things winded down. Uh, First of all, I want to call to order this this meeting, this meeting of the Lions of Liberty National Convention. Uh, Does anybody have any points of order, points of interest, uh, motions to consider? Uh, Go fuck yourself. How about that? Uh, Mr. Odermatt, you were not formally called upon. (laughs) Can you please mute your mic? Man, what, what a... It was a shit show, but a shit show that I, I think at least me and Odie, who'd been to a convention for, weren't totally unprepared for. Uh, unlike Mr. McWilliams, as, as Mr. Starwark uh, referred to him, thank you, Mr. McWilliams, um, <laughs> who really, really got fired up on Friday night and was really dismayed by the whole thing. Uh, but I think those of us that have been there before, I, I got to be honest, it was not as bad as I thought it could be, except towards the end, the last couple hours. But we will get to all this. Of course, I'm here with uh, host of Felony Friday, John Odermatt. We also have uh, the man of the hour, the man of uh, the godfather of Lions of Liberty, Howie. The man of the hour? Why is he the man of I the just hour? made that up. I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, I've been on, I, I agree I've been with on you. Zoom calls for 30 hours. So It, it wasn't that bad. It, the only things that were horrible were Friday night, taking however long that was to set the freaking agenda, and then today. Really, yesterday was, I don't know. I mean, there was a lot of voting and a lot of you know, downtime <laughs> and that stuff, but it wasn't that bad. No, just towards the end, but I think we should talk somewhat chronologically. Um, first of all, what are you drinking there, Odie? Is that a probiotic uh, Sierra, or alcohol? Sierra Nevada alcohol, and then I'm going to switch to some – Cold, refreshing Coors Light. I am just drinking vodka and squirt. That's that's what I've got going on. Vodka and what? Squirt. I just said squirrel. So I'm like, oh my god, what are you doing? Yeah, it's a little. Mexico's weird. You here? We squeeze squirrel uh, blood into our vodka and we drink it. Squirrel brains. Yeah. Uh, I am broadcasting live from Mexico on what is supposed to be better internet, but suddenly became not better internet before this. Hopefully, things will go well. We are streaming to the Pride. Another great reason to join our Patreon. Join us on, on the, in the Pride, uh, where we live stream so many of these shows, uh, unlike the plebeians who have to hear this on Monday morning. Uh, but an extra bonus right now that I want to remind everybody about, we are still giving 10% of our Pride donations to Donor C for, uh, to help them with everything they're doing to help people all across the world, especially the third world, with uh, coronavirus, all that's going on with the lockdowns, inability to get supplies to people. Uh, so we've been able to fund some really awesome projects with that. So I just wanted to mention that before I completely forget about the charity work that we're doing here. And can you uh, can you stop your screen share? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> well, some behind-the-scenes yeah. action, folks. I was sharing the screen before the show so we could all hear. This is much better. This is much better about the screen share. Um, Howie, you've been awfully silent since we started here. It's very, un- very un-Howie-like. You must not be drunk. Well... 
I don't know. I've been drinking since this morning. I've <laughs> been drinking this uh, Guinness drop, but it's a special can that's got a sun on it. When I saw that at the store, I'm like, well, the sun must mean it's for the, when you get up in the morning. So that's since about 11 a.m. today that I've been. That is called Howie marketing. That's called marketing directly to Howie. Speaking of marketing, or maybe it's not marketing, if you notice with Guinness that like once or twice a year, normally you buy Guinness, it comes like in those little sub four packs, you know, and it's like uh, packaged up in little four packs. Yeah. Like once or twice a year, they won't have that. They'll just have a whole case, individual cans wrapped up, but it's like $10 cheaper. And I don't know, I don't understand like what, I love it, but I don't, I don't understand it. I don't know why they're doing it. I don't it, see that do a that. lot. Here in Virginia, there's always the four packs. There's always eight packs. And then you could also get a case. And the price is incomparable. I'm saying even when you buy a case most of the time, it still comes in those four packs. Ah. Anyway. Well, yeah. here in Xochitepec, Mexico, the sale of booze is not allowed. But we drove to a nearby city about 20 minutes away called Cuernavaca, where it's unclear whether booze is not allowed, but they have a funny sign on the store in Spanish. And this is a store that only sells liquor, by the way. So, but it's, so what Mexico does when they're in times of a crisis or they believe there might be political protests, they ban the sales of alcohol. It's state by state. So in, the, in this state, they did ban the sale of alcohol. However, for some reason in the city, some stores still sell it. And they have a sign on the door in Spanish, of course, that says basically like, uh, don't ask us if, if we sell alcohol. So we're not talking about that. But then you go in and the only thing they sell is alcohol. So uh, you go buy a bunch of alcohol. It's the very Mexican. Uh, if you well, I like it. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, Mexico is not a libertarian country. There's no such thing, really. But, uh, and especially if you just looked at the laws on the books, you would definitely think this is not a libertarian place. But there's a very libertarian undertone to the attitude that people have towards the government that... It's, it's basically just accepted that the government is corrupt. Everybody knows that. Everybody agrees on that. There's no uh, question about that. And they sort of act accordingly. Uh, whereas I feel like in the United States, uh, so many of our fellow citizens really truly have faith in the system where here they kind of look at it as cynically from the outset, which I think is, you know, it's a nice change of pace anyway. So libertarian thing happened this weekend. Oh yeah. That's what we we're going to talk about. <laughs> I thought this is a one hour symposium on my time in Mexico and my libertarian thoughts that maybe I'll do for the pride. So uh, I'd like to now. just start by congratulating our new presidential and vice presidential candidates, uh, Joe Jorgensen and Scott, Spike Cohen, Scott Horton, Scott Horton. Scott Horton. In there. <laughs> no, no, no. Spike Cohen. But I did hear that um, the Jorgensen campaign might be convinced to take Scott Horton on as a foreign policy advisor. I've heard that he's a, he's a Joe Jorgensen fan. Or not, maybe not fan, but he's, I don't know. Apparently, no, no, he, was, or, he was a Hornberger guy, but he's willing to advise anybody that'll listen to him and he, he'll do it and he's great. And hopefully she takes him up on it. I, I did, funny. I did notice today she was sharing some memes and stuff and I heard that she got a new social media like person. So that's what did they fire Caitlin Cloven? She was her social media. What, was it? No, I, I don't think they I mean, I don't think they let go anybody because uh, she was praising her in her speech. Uh, Caitlin Cloven, friend of the show. Uh, but I don't know. It's interesting seeing that the various reactions from libertarians out there. But I think if we I think we have to look at the bigger picture here, because a lot of people were very disappointed by Joe Jorgensen being nominated. Uh, not for any reason like she's she's bad or anything I, I mean she's was harry brown's running mate as far as i can tell she is at the, at the minimum she's a very solid minarchist which is essentially what jacob hornberger was although they have very different styles i mean jacob hornberger is a minarchist he's not an anarchist so and essentially we got someone who is is about as not statist as a candidate that the, that the libertarian party has put up since you could say michael badnerick i guess or maybe yeah. even since harry brown Definitely. Probably, yeah. She's absolutely more libertarian than Bob Barr, not even close. She's definitely more libertarian than Gary Johnson, even, I would say. And we all know she's way more libertarian than Bill Weld. And there's no Bill Weld type person anywhere mm -hmm. near this ticket. Spike Cohen is awesome. He's an anarchist. He had to win over some of the Joe Jorgensen votes to get this place. So there is some sort of uh, overlapping there between the pragmatists and the anarchists, as you might say, the, the radicals slash the Mises caucus, I would say it represents about half the party and the pragmatists probably represent about the other half. And if you're not interested in libertarian party, party politics, I would say this episode might not be for you, but we have so much fun on this stuff. I think this episode will still be for I think you. This so, episode's for everybody. This episode's I mean, yeah, for everybody. That's right. You're going to see but behind the scenes, behind the curtain. Whether you the, love it or you uh, hate it, we're going to have fun talking about it. And gonna... How the donuts get made, as they say. <laughs> Is that what we made this weekend? <laughs> 
Um, so, Mark, you, you bring up the two candidates, and I think it's huge that we have one that's a pragmatic and one that is an anarchist and appeals to the Radical Caucus, the Mises Caucus. Like, I, I'm so glad they went with Spike as vice president because I think it's really going to be able to unite the party and keep it together because the, at first when Joe got it, you know, there's different factions and people were upset. But like you said, she is a libertarian. Um, a monarchist, like, like you said, I, I think my only real criticism would just be that she might not be as charismatic or as uh, like mm-hmm. attention grabbing as you might want, but she's solid and she's good. And with Spike, I'm very happy with the ticket. Yeah, just, I mean, just to take you through my timeline. So last night as it's- Cody oh, wasn't on, in the discord, so we have no idea what he's been thinking this whole time. <laughs> I think I've posted everything I've thought on Facebook so people could probably figure it out. But so yeah, so last night I'm not gonna lie, she wins. It's not like I was upset, but I was disappointed for the reasons that Howie cited there. You know, she's not, you know, some energetic that's gonna draw massive attention just because of who she is, her character, her personality, or anything like that. Um, but like Mark was saying, she is actually a libertarian. I mean, she might not be an anarchist, she's not, but she's the first libertarian we've had running on the libertarian ticket since Harry Brown, maybe? I, I don't know. Um, so I, I kind of woke up today. I, I would at like, least, I would make an argument that Michael Bednarik is pretty solid. Yeah. He was, he framed himself as more of a constitutionalist, but that's, uh, I mean, that's not that far right, from what right. George Jones. Ben Derrick's, he's, he's a libertarian. He, he was like a sovereign yeah. citizen. He, okay. didn't even have so, a, yeah. he didn't even have a driver's license. Yeah, so, okay. so he's for so sure a libertarian. <laughs> he's for <laughs> sure a libertarian. Since Ben yeah. we'll go with that. He's hardcore. Um, he refused to have a driver's license. He got, like, he's got to get points <laughs> with that. But I, I, I woke up today and, you know, what would really switch me Switch my mind and the way I'm thinking about this is I saw a post from uh, Jess Mears talking about the I'm with her hashtag. And after I responded to her saying how dumb that would be to make that the official slogan. That'd be awesome. And, uh, and instead say, use something like, uh, she's with us or anything, but I'm with her because that's egotistical. And did you come up with that? Because I saw that. I saw it. you post that this morning and then I saw a bunch of people using it. Were you, did you come up with a she's with us or is that multiple? People no, I definitely that? did not come up with it, but I did saw no one else post it. But then as I was looking back, other people have said the same thing. So there's other brilliant people out there other than myself. Well, if you saw I'm no one else post it, then you did come up with it in your own mind. I love it. I did in my own mind. Yeah. That's what I mean. I love it. I think it's great. I think it's great. I think it's way better than I'm with her. Don't don't associate that with us. But she's with us is good. It's like we're all. It's way more of a it's not an ego mm-hmm. thing. It's just like yeah, she's with, she's our girl. And even though she wasn't my first or second choice, I love the fact that the Democrats, especially and the Republicans, have old white men. It could be like, why aren't you going to vote for the women? Are you sexist? We've got a woman <laughs> candidate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just. I mean, not that. I especially think- when you have two. Creepy old men. <laughs> they are, they are the, the other yeah. two candidates. Not that I think that it should matter, but just to highlight their hypocrisy and their talking points. Yeah. And not just... to speak against anything that's been said about Biden and Trump, because the truth is, I have no idea. But these are both men that have had some level of accusations of sexism, sexual assault, sexual misconduct, that sort of sexually inappropriate behavior. No comment over whether it's true or not with either of them, because I honestly don't know. But there's nothing like that with Joe. Quite the opposite. I mean, this is just like a, a flawless spotlight. Not flawless, but you know what I mean? There's nothing. Flawless. There's no scandal you're going to find. Perfect. There's, there's no scandal you're going to find on Joe. Scandal-free campaign. <laughs> and her name is Joe, which is also the same name as Joe Biden. So, I mean, there's yeah. so We can much- use that. We can use that, too. Unbelievable. Yeah. I've actually been talking myself into it a lot more over the past 24 hours. I'm trying to think of a way to to tie in like the Joe versus the volcano somehow. (laughs) We can work on it. We can work on it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there are some concerns. I mean, there's some concerns around uh, really her stance around the Second Amendment. I'm not clear on that. I know people have kind of questioned it. I don't remember any debate answers where she's really been crystal clear on, on where she falls on. She does like to say she supports the party platform, but she has to say more than that in the media. She has to, mm-hmm. she has to not even say that in the media because no one gives a shit what the libertarian party platform is. Not even a lot of libertarians. So I want her to clearly state positions, but I think we're in a good position in the fa- fact that she has Spike as her VP and she has a bunch of people like us, like the libertarian media that will support her when she says good things and hound mm-hmm. her when she does bad things. You know, I already have Brian's segment name. I, what do you guys think? I think he should use say it ain't Joe. For things oh that she yeah, says yeah. That, oh, I, like I think it. that's perfect. Yeah, although and you I, can use that for Biden too. But and I really think this is important. And I mean, it's the way we try to treat everyone. It's just even with like Rand Paul and people like, like you said, Mark, praise when they do well, criticize when they don't. It's how and we I should treat everybody. At, at the start here, though, what, even if you might have some like concerns, I would say, all right, fresh slate. 
let's give her a chance, give her some support, see how she do, does. If she does good, praise her. If she doesn't, criticize her. That's that's how we do. Even during her uh, acceptance speech, or after Spike won and they had their dual thing, and Spike pretty much ceded all his time to her, and she was going through her, her talking points, and she said something like, and they're locking people up for not wearing a mask and they're letting criminals free. And I'm like, oh, I don't like how she phrased that. Mm. But then like a paragraph later, a couple sentences later, she's like, and I would free all nonviolent drug offenders. I'm like, okay. Well, right. Yeah. But in her defense, they are releasing violent offenders, which to me is crazy. To me, it's like, all right, let every single nonviolent offender well, it's out. Case, I think when it comes to violent offenders... Yeah, to be case, case by case, case, case by case, nonviolent. Yeah, let them all go. Yeah. Like, I mean, keep in mind, a violent offender could also be someone who is 17 years old and punched someone in the face. And well, because I mean, 10 years ago, you know, I, I mean, keep I, seeing I, all these news stories where we let this violent dude out and he like murdered someone and five hours later. And it's like, to me, it's like, all right, well, maybe that was like the guy, especially when they're arresting people for not wearing masks or not social well, distancing that's the most for all this nonsense. It's like, maybe you kept that guy there and you didn't arrest these other people. There's part know, of me, me I, if I was in California anyway, I would want to defy one of these laws and get arrested because I think they're, not really, but I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of people that get arrested for non-laws that that fight the, these things with lawsuits eventually between businesses, people arrested yeah, for it. If people get arrested for wearing masks or not socially distancing, I mean, there's going to be lawsuits galore. And I think people are going to win a lot of them too. Cause as far as I can tell, yeah. there's no basis, not even in the U S constitution, forget that. But in, the, in these state constitutions for people just for governors to just be shutting down businesses by just decree and, and telling just making up laws by decree. These are not even laws passed by state bodies. These are just governors <laughs> saying stuff. And then I guess, various levels of enforcement. Yeah, and it is Judge Knapp's opinion that people are going to win these lawsuits. I mean, it sucks having to go to court and pay the money for the lawyers and stuff, but if you got the cash, it might be worth making the point. Well, I would just use mm-hmm. pride money for my lawsuit. That's okay. <laughs> That's cool, guys, right? Rick, Rick will be your lawyer. Meanwhile, they're starving children in Malawi because we didn't, didn't pay our, uh, our, we didn't pay donor seed last month because I had to go fight a lawsuit. Um, That's not true. Are, are we still... Um, is that still happening? Because I stopped advertising Absolutely. it. I were you not here 20 it. minutes ago when I said that we were doing it? Of course. Okay, yeah. good. As long as, uh, I think as long as there's a COVID response to respond to. I, I'm, uh, I'm glad. I'm glad we yeah. are. I like it. They're doing great work. And I, what I love about donors is that we get to, it's not like we just send money and it goes into the oblivion. We're funding specific projects. I'm always choosing projects that we can afford to close out <laughs> with the money we're using each month. So then we know, like, we did this. Like, we helped this person. We fed this person for a month. Or I, I got to relook at the, what the last one was. But I think we paid enough to uh, afford someone's baby food for, like, a year. Uh, right now, or the amazing. last one might have been someone's rent. There's been a couple. It's, but, it's um, such, a, it's such yeah. an incredible such an incredible app, incredible uh, way to do charity. And every time, like, I tell someone about it in person, they're like, oh, my God, that's the greatest idea I've ever heard. Um, but it's just hard to get that momentum to, to get it really built up to compete with these charity giants. I love seeing this libertarian volunteerism, mutual aid, helping people out and doing the things that the government always does wrong. That was one of the things I really liked the Vermin Supremes stressed, which is why I had endorsed him in the beginning. Well, not that, that was one part of why, but I was wondering, we know who won, but going into it, who are your like, like one and two picks and like, why, what, what were you hoping would happen? Do you want to now start, that it's, Now that it's all said and done. Yeah. Why don't you start, Howie? I think we were all, well, Odie might have been slightly different than us, but we'll, we'll see. We'll go around. Sure, sure. On the president's side, for the longest time, I wanted Jacob Hornberger because I agree with him probably like 99% of the issues. It's like, all right, he wants to end the wars. He thinks the war on drugs is stupid. He's like our guy. It's not some Bill Weld, Kerry Johnson, like fake libertarian. And it's like, granted, he's not as charismatic as uh, maybe you might like it even. And, and I mean, I, I do love Jacob, but a lot of times when I'd hear him in debates and answer questions and stuff, I'd be like, ah, oh, Ron Paul had answered this better. But leading up to it, I eventually be, became convinced that the best thing the party could do would be to nominate Vermin Supreme. And I couldn't believe I even thought that because I just viewed him as a joke. But the more I thought about it and looked into him and things, I realized it's like, wait, no. This whole system is a joke. He's a satirist. And when I actually heard him speak seriously, which he does, he just uses like the the gimmicks to get people's attention. Like he's a real libertarian. He he has a lot of social media reach, a lot of of ways to get eyes on the party. And I feel like he, 
you know, people that don't get the joke, they weren't going to listen to us anyways. People don't take libertarians seriously, but the younger people that would get attracted by that, then maybe listen to Lions of Liberty podcast, we could flesh things out for them. Um, and for the VP slot, I really wanted Spike. I became familiar with him just maybe like a month ago, but he's so well-spoken and I felt like, wow, this would be such, such a great thing for the party. And then we had other people in there like Larry Sharp, who is also great and could raise a lot of money and get a lot, a lot of traction going. Uh, so those were, those were what I was thinking about. And I got, I got half my ticket. Um, and again, Joe, she wasn't my first or second choice. But I'm happy with it. I'm willing to give her a chance. I'm going to support her until something happens where I, I don't think we should. But I don't, I don't see that being the case. She was Harry Brown's running mate. She's been around forever. She's, she's a libertarian. I think her and Spike's a good combo. And, you know, I, I still think Vermin and Spike might have gotten more eyes on, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, since I'll go next just because I'm, I'm not that far off from, from Howie's thoughts. Uh, after, especially after the last few cycles, I really just at first was a big Hornberger supporter because I wanted to hear just someone please just be able to state the principles clearly. Like I, that was like the only thing on my mind. But the more I got to know Vermin Supreme, and I think it really started for me uh, at Porkfest last year where I did an interview with him. Dan Smots was there. That's when Dan Smots first met him too. And we were just kind of on the fly like, oh, let's interview Vermin Supreme. This will be fun. And what I found was not just the joke satirist who I just watched do his show, you know, a half hour earlier and his show was hilarious. Uh, but I didn't get the character of Vermin Supreme when I interviewed him. I got the character, sort of, but I also got the actual person. And he explained how he was running a real campaign and he was serious about libertarian ideas and he really wanted to offer his service as someone with a big following, someone who can get a lot of media attention. He had been on, he's been in mainstream news a bunch. Uh, they love him because he's ridiculous and hilarious and uh, you know he draws attention. So uh, the more I began to realize there was sort of a merger between the character of Vermin Supreme and the human being whose real name is Vermin Supreme, uh, that, that that person is a very deep thinking person. I also met him at the California convention again, uh, talked to him there, interviewed him there. And I just, I just more I got to know him, the more I was impressed with him, not just as an entertainer, but as an actual person and an, an actual you know, libertarian philosopher in a way. I mean, he'd been an anar anarchist his whole life. A lot of people say he's associated with the left anarchists or what have you. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you're for voluntary relationships, I don't care what kind of where you want to go from there. That, that's what I care about. And he was out there preaching that kind of uh, those sort of relationships. So I, I warmed up to Vermin Supreme more and more and more. And eventually he will he be, he was who I voted for in the first two rounds. Uh, I did switch to Hornberger in the third round, I, I think, if I'm going correctly, or it might have been the third round. Or fourth round. How many rounds? I, I don't, were, I don't there remember. Were four, there were four rounds, right? There were four rounds. I, I'll yeah. tell you, I did two votes for Vermin Supreme. I did one vote for John Mons strategically. Once I realized that it was going to be Joe, I did prefer Mons to Joe. So I, I did switch to Mons towards the end because I, I want, I think it was actually the second to last round, not the last, last round I voted for Hornberger because I did prefer him over Joe. And I didn't think Vermin was going to win at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I did want Mons over Joe. So I was trying to keep Mons in at the end because I did think he could, he could actually draw from Hornberger and Supreme people. Whereas I didn't think, I didn't think Hornberger Supreme could draw really from the Mons and Jorgensen people as much. So that I did switch to Mons for a minute, but in the last vote I voted for Hornberger. But at the end of the day, while I was disappointed in the sense that Joe Jorgensen never truly excited me, uh, she never got me really like, oh, I got I, I to gotta see Joe as the nominee. Uh, I think a little time has passed since then and I've, I've really settled into it a bit. And especially with Spike being, being uh, voted in as VP, I think it's a really good combo in a lot of ways, especially because it does really keep the party united in so many ways. Whereas if it was Vermin Supreme, even though I think it would have been awesome, I think he would have got a ton of attention, there would have been about half the party that would be very upset about it. Like, there's no doubt about it. But there was a lot of people that just thought he would make people look too much like a joke. And even though I don't agree with that philosophy, because they already look at, at us like a joke, like how he was saying, I, you know, I... It, it's in a way it is good to please the pragmatists like there are there are half the party you know so it's kind of good that we don't have a completely we have a sort of unified party now because we got a, a great anarchist who was endorsed by hornberger and Furman supreme uh the two next biggest candidates and we got a pragmatist who's not bad she's not a pragmatist like think about this a few months ago we thought lincoln, lincoln chafee might end up being pushed on us as the nominee she's light years ahead of Lincoln Chafee and, and Lincoln Chafee didn't gain traction because of this movement of sort of more libertarian libertarians. People that have signed up through us, through Dave Smith, through Tom Woods, through Scott Horton, through, uh, P through uh, Pete Raymond. Um, 
people that have Pico Nunes, sorry, I forgot he made the Overton window has been pushed. Yes, that's where I was going with all this. Uh, I've talked enough. I'll let Odie give his thoughts back. The Overton window has been pushed to the point where Judge Gray, Judge Jim Gray, was, I mean, him, like, even like the last couple of debates, listening to him compared to all the, all the other candidates, including Joe, he sounded just like, it's like, wait a minute, this guy is like it's so obvious that he's on the total fringe he's now on the fringe of libertarianism of the libertarian party and everyone else is is sort of you know i'm not saying that joe's an anarchist or or uh, a mean minar- i guess yeah joe and hornberger are both minarchists but um it just made it very apparent that that time has passed the time of the gary johnson's the bill welds um the bob bars uh, yeah, I mean, Gary Johnson of, wasn't even a minarchist. You know, he he definitely believed in a much yeah. more bigger role for government than the than the, quote unquote the basics, uh, which would be you know I guess national defense and police and courts essentially. And apparently, uh, he also cannot uh, record video of himself to send in for a nomination <laughs> speech. But anyway, that's either here nor there. Was he supposed to do that for somebody? I I don't know. But it was so odd that it would uh, so. You think he would do that for Gray? You think he would have? Yeah, enjoyed, yeah, for, for Jim yeah, Gray. So Larry Sharp hosted a, a Jim Gray nomination, and it was a video they played. And uh, Larry's bringing in different people, and he brings in Gary Johnson, a video of Gary Johnson. All it is is an audio recording and a ridiculous, ridiculous picture of Gary in like a a jean, a jean uh, long sleeve shirt, <laughs> a wrinkled undershirt, just like looking at the camera, like oh. God, There's I so much smoked, I love about Gary Johnson. And I just smoked a joint. What am I doing here? But <laughs> how did I get this? here, man? <laughs> Anyway, so just to take you, I'll go real quick through my uh, my thought process over the last couple of days. So I uh, I guess I'm, even before the last couple of days, be- beginning of this, you know, whole cycle with Hornberger, I was I was on the Hornberger uh, train. And uh, I guess I kind of I kind of got to the point as I got to know more candidates and see, you know, see other other candidates speak. I really saw a difference in communication. I saw the way that Jacob communicates I did not think personally would really resonate um, with uh, with the American people, um, unless he was able to get on a debate stage with uh, Donald Trump and a Joe Biden, and you could see that contrast right in your face. Jacob Hordberger being interviewed on, on the MSM, I, I just think it would be it would just be lost in the uh, just lost in time. It wouldn't it wouldn't hit home with anybody. So I kind of pushed Hordberger aside. The first person I went with, who I thought really could. Uh, capture attention, make it interesting was Mark Whitney. Mark Whitney, unfortunately, went a little bit too far overboard and blew things up in Florida and was never able to recover. I still like Mark. Uh, he's a good guy. Hopefully he uh, does well in his, uh, his running. He's running for Senate, one of the seats there in California in uh, 2022. Yeah, he's I guess. Supposedly he's going to try to run against Kamala Harris. What sucks yeah. about California, well, I could list a million things, but what sucks <laughs> is we have this, this top two system so the only chance for him to be in the general election against Kamala Harris is to be one of the top two vote getters in the primary, which means he has to beat a Republican in the primary to even be in in the, the general election. Which is a stupid rule, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what can happen. Anyway, not to get too far off base. Turning forward to... Oh, you don't think talking about the 2022 the California <laughs> primary, Senate primary is getting too off topic? or Nothing's <laughs> off topic here. Everything's off topic. <laughs> Um, so turning forward to, uh, the convention this weekend, I honestly, looking at all the candidates, it's not like I disliked any of them. I'm like, you know, there's a lot of good candidates here. They're all pretty much libertarians except for judge gray. But even with judge gray, you have a, a lot of people give me shit for, cause I've defended him a couple different times. I, I never voted for him, um, during this uh, convention. But what I like about judge gray is he's a judge who is it's against the judge. drug war. He's, he's against the drug war. I mean, how rare is that? So just be, if you ever run a candidate like that, that's one thing. I, Did I you do- not though? I always found his drug answers slightly unsatisfactory, like when pushed on it. Like it doesn't seem like he would really just legalize all drugs. He kept using the excuse of, well, I got to keep him away from kids. But I, I think there was a little more to it than that. It, it kind of seemed like how he was wishy-washy on the jury nullification thing. He didn't seem as anti-drug war as I would have liked. But no, it, it is a good admiral thing for an actual judge to take the position that he did when he did. Yeah, and hopefully yeah. he supports Joe and goes out there and talks for her and you know, is another mouthpiece for a Libertarian Party. That, that's fine with me. Joe but, was one of the people he had named. I think actually he endorsed Joe when he dropped out. So I did think- he? Joe has, what's good about Joe is like, there's no one against her really. Like some people are, at worst, some people are just not excited about her because they don't find her super exciting. 
but she, she already seems like she's getting better. She already talked, you know, we, we know she has a media consultant who's working with her. Like, it's not like she's just going to say, yeah, I know I haven't been exciting and I don't care. Like she's already shown that she's trying to work on, you know, her media appearances and, you mm-hmm. know, she's a libertarian. I mean, that's like, that's a victory. She needs yeah. to get Dan Smots on speed dial. The, the, she might. The Spike Cowan being in there, it might happen. Yeah, the advertisements he did for Vermin Supreme were excellent. Yeah. Like, uh, he'll really be working magic away. if Dan can make the same kind of ads for Joe. But This could be uh, Dan Smots' uh, launching board into uh, commercial yeah. fame or whatever. It, it already has been. I mean, not to toot his horn too much because he's not paying us for ad time right now. But uh, <laughs> Dan Smots, host of The System is Down, who also does our graphics, also made the ad Actually, for Dan Vermin Smolt, Supreme. Actually, Dan Smoltz, he's made oh, yeah. his real I name. I forgot we were doing his real name now. Yeah, uh, Dan Smolt. Uh, yeah, he's he's done a kick-ass job with those ads. They reminded me of an even better produced version of the ads that Judd Weiss did for John McAfee's oh, yeah. campaign four years ago, which yeah. he said is, has been an inspiration for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, this might land him a real job with the, the Jorgensen mm-hmm. campaign. We'll see. And it, it should. I mean, yeah. he deserves to, to be doing this for real. Hey, Mark, not, so it's not that it's not to, for real to, now. But to I mean, finish out, let me finish out my convention thing. I'm, I'm talking way too long. Anyway, so I backed, I backed Mons, John Mons to start. I like John first, Mons. He was your first uh, round? He, he was my first round, and I, I stuck with him all the way through until he was out. And then as soon as when he, when he was the uh, you know, lowest tier vote, I switched to Hornberger. And that's when I made that post on Facebook because I, I basically at that point I realized, oh, Joe's going to win now. How did this happen? Um, so I, I made a post on Facebook that the only way that um, Joe would lose would be a vermin backed Hornberger, which was not going to happen, but I just fucking threw it up there. And, and in uh, hindsight, even that wouldn't have done it. No, he could have put still, them both together. Still be both of them combined. So yeah. true, true. Barely, but. She did. Since everybody oh, yeah. put, put their votes on the record, I want to put mine on the record. <laughs> round one, round two, I voted for Vermin Supreme. Round three and round four, I, I when I realized he didn't have a chance of winning, I, I went behind Hornberger and voted for Jacob. Yeah. Yeah. And the people in the in the Mises caucus might say, well, you should have been with him from the beginning. Um he didn't run the best campaign. I mean, especially the last couple of weeks, he really he did some questionable things. Um, you know, and a lot of people got eh. upset, upset with him about so they said he was negative or attacking. But it's like, well, listen, if we want somebody to be going after Trump, to me, I didn't see that as like a big deal. It's like we kind yeah, of it's not like he some- was just smearing people. Like completely. No. I mean, he was attacking Justin Amash's positions and stated things. Maybe criticizing the CIA link was a little silly because that was like some generic link that every congressman had. But like, you know, he was going after their positions. He was going after their statements. He was going after the things they said. It's politics. It's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go after your opponents. It's not like he, he said Joe Jorgensen is a, you know, baby killer. Like, you know, he didn't but do anything. It's, it's different. Ridiculous. It is politics, but I do think it's, it's a different kind of politics inside the Libertarian Party. Like, you no, can't look at it like, sure. oh, it's politics, like the Democrats and Republicans are playing politics. It's very, well, I think still, it's very but, different inside the LP. He wasn't, he wasn't being like Trump. It was markedly different. I'm not saying he it was wasn't not like I saw Joe Jorgensen bleeding from her eyes after her plastic surgery. Like, <laughs> I think I think my my point is was, I I think Amash's the, dad killed uh, Kennedy. <laughs> the, the, the lesson I here, wish that's what he did. That would be hilarious. I think the lesson, and maybe people have already started to uh, learn this lesson, was Spike Cohen getting the VP nod. I mean, he kind of was the. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. He 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 did this. He uh, he, he he built relationships across the board. He's an anarchist. Yeah. He's friends with lots of different people. At the end, when uh, Ken Armstrong dropped out, he endorsed Spike Cohen. Um, that surprised so, me because I, I pictured so him more on the the sort of pragmatist side of yeah, things. So I thought he I, would go I, I don't understand it actually. I wish I'd like to know some more backstory. I, think, I want I to know the behind the scenes conversations. Yeah, relationships in the Libertarian Party, Trump. Uh, disagreements on uh philosophy i mean that's why that's joe won she's had these relationships for for mm-hmm. 20 years now i mean literally for with a lot of these people a lot of these delegates that have been around a long time and she a lot of people like her uh she knows a lot of people all those people were supporting her and she hasn't done anything so bad to piss off anybody like i, I can't say a bad thing about george organson like negative i mean yeah, maybe she didn't give the. Maybe she said something about, "Oh, I think we should have people on the ground in other countries gathering intelligence," and some people might take that as support for the CIA, even though she's, she's against the CIA. But if you're a minarchist and you're for some kind of, you know, military, then that would probably be a part of it. So it's, it, I'm not for it, but think about how far we've come from again. Th- th- Gary Johnson, a- Bill Well, Bob Barr. It's it's huge. Honestly. This is something I have to say too, because it's a problem I have with a lot of candidates. Like, all right, we're not gonna win this election. So when you're talking about all your 
the de- fine details of your plans that are never, ever going to happen. It's kind of silly. It's, it seems like, yeah, it's silly. It, it's a waste of time. I just want someone to talk about the core principles that we espouse. And like, for example, that's, I know a lot of people love Larry Sharp. One of the things that I like about him, he's got like these complicated plans for everything that he thinks that like the normal voter, oh, like they'll get on board with that. It's like, oh yeah, well, we're not going to win. You're not going to ever do any of that. Can we just stress this, the principles? Like, listen, the government shouldn't be doing this. You're going to screw it up. Like we don't have to come up with these complicated kind of like half liberty, half status plans that and to me, I think that's one reason why I couldn't get behind like what Adam Kokesh was trying to do. Because this whole thing, it's like, all right, you're not going to win. This plan is ridiculous. I don't think you could even put it in place if you did win. And you're wasting so much time talking about how you're going to become the custodian of the government as we go through bankruptcy and dissolve it instead of actually addressing our liberties. Why should someone be a libertarian? Why should they care what we say? What are we all about? Like, it just seems like these complicated convoluted plans when we know we're not going to win. I just want to talk about our values in a way that inspires people. I think like, like Ron Paul did a lot. And well, I, I think that's a good point. You brought up Ron Paul there. Cause I think there's a right way and a wrong, maybe not a right and wrong, but maybe an effective and ineffective way. And the way Ron Paul was able to resonate, number one, he was in the a mainstream party. He was on the debate stage. So he was able to reach a lot more people and he was given legitimacy because he was standing on, on a debate stage and people knew he was you know, elected Republican, blah, blah, blah. And when he said things that were even controversial controversial, and caused that contrast, and when he says, bring the troops home, talks about blowback, talks about these different things, and the people on that stage were like, oh my God, what's wrong with you? But the people watching saw that and like, oh wow, and light bulbs go off. It's hard to get that contrast in principles. And I'm not saying that we should have elaborate plans. And I do agree with you on the Larry Sharp criticisms. I think part of the problem with Larry is he ran a campaign for governor where a lot of that is sort of called upon when you're doing town halls and getting questions and you have to develop those plans and you, how are you going to run the ed- education system in your state and all this shit. Um, so he's kind of stuck in that world and bringing that with him into you know running for vice president. But I think that the key is the Ron Paul plan. Keep it simple. Have a couple of things that you go back to. And the Fed. Oh, why, why should we end the Fed? And then talk about the reasons why. Some of the, the, uh, the, the repercussions from it. It's, it's hurting poor people the most. Um, it's helping these, uh, these corporations to grow and expand. They get the money first. Easy things for people to understand. Bring the troops home. Um, why bring the yeah, troops and home? The, the, way, back. Like, the way he says, like, well, how are we going to do that? We just marched in. We can just march out. Yeah. yeah. Or like, well, Dr. Paul, 50% of people don't pay, even pay income tax. Well, then we're halfway there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, somebody should run a campaign just on his, just what he said. Just he had the, the best thing. comebacks for all of that stuff. Like, and they, and it was all without ever getting to complicated details. It was just like a witty, true retort every time. So we would you really, say, you didn't have a plan doing that. So we don't need a plan coming out. Would you really even legalize heroin? How many people here are going to start doing heroin if it's legal? <laughs> <laughs> that was the best. <laughs> Hey there, Liberty Kitties. Time to take a quick time out to tell you about one of our longtime supporters. His name is Tyler Colford, and he goes by the pseudonym Crypto Man. That's his rapping name. That's right. He is a rapper as well. He does some awesome stuff, and he recently produced a track called Free Ross. And the Ross in question is, of course, Ross Ulbricht, the creator of the Silk Road Marketplace, who was sentenced to two life sentences for creating that marketplace. Yes, it was a black market in of all sorts of things, including drugs, consensual transactions, which libertarians are completely in favor of. There were no victims and there were no crimes as far as we're concerned. So please do check out the track Free Ross. It was just released on Friday, March 27th, the 35th birthday of Ross Ulbricht. And 100% of the proceeds will go to the Free Ross Foundation which is uh, helping to free Ross and bring more awareness to his situation. Do check out the links. I will put them all over at lionsofliberty.com slash free Ross for ease of use. You can also pre-order it on Google Play. Again, 100% of the proceeds of this track will be going to help free Ross. Still wonder why there's an overpopulation in the prison system, persecuting crimes from the original victim, parents doing time, separating children, perpetuating crime to a future generation. Still the gen... Every time I reminisce about the Ron Paul campaign, I realize more and more how it's, I think a lot of people were hoping the Jacob Hornberger Burger campaign would be a recreation of it. We just got to realize it's never going to be recreated. You can't recreate 
this magic moment that was the perfect moment in time with the perfect person at the exact right time, getting the right amount of attention that they could still get because they were in the right place at that right time. We're never going to recreate it. So let's not look for that path again. Let's just look for different paths. And I think the one we're on right now, it could be a lot worse. We could have, honestly, we could have Chafee and uh, I don't know. I don't know who right now. Someone, we could have Chafee Gray, which wouldn't, you know, Gray isn't, isn't terrible. But Chafee so, Gray compared to Mons, uh, and Mons, sorry. Chafee Gray. Chafee Gray, Chafee Gray sounds like a, either a porn star or a country music <laughs> star. I can't tell. We could have had a Mosh. What do you all think about that? possibility that didn't materialize that's a tough one because if we're going to be honest amash is yeah we can question some of the things he said in the media the guy's a libertarian we can question his chance against trump but the guy's a libertarian i mean he's been i mean compared to the rest of like compared to let's say even lincoln chafee i mean is there any question we would just be ecstatic about Amash, if he just beat it. What if this last, this nomination came down to 51% Amash, 49% Lincoln Chafee? We'd be high-fiving and hugging over Amash winning. So it's all very relative. Of course, you can say the same thing if Lincoln yeah. Chafee was against Joe. I'd probably be all for Joe if it came down to her and Chafee. And if, I'm not even if, that anti-Chafee. I thought he was a really nice guy who was way more genuine than Bill Weld, who was, I, I really got to think he was truly just trying to learn about libertarianism, didn't agree with everything, and didn't pretend to. Unlike Bill Weld, who basically just said, like, oh, I'm a libertarian for life. I'll, I'll agree with everything. And then immediately went off platform the second he got out. Lincoln Chafee seemed to me pretty, pretty honest about it. He's like, I'm learning about this stuff. Um, I like a lot of the overall ideals. He never lied about his positions. When I interviewed him, I was very impressed that he never seemed to give an answer that I wanted to hear necessarily. When it, when it wasn't something he agreed with fully, he would just say that. So I think even, even the Chafee thing wasn't as bad as what we saw from Bill Weld. So, and the fact that we pushed, I, we didn't push Chafee out of the party, but we pushed him out of the nomination. Not we, but I think principal people pushed, pushed him from, stopped him from getting a lot of traction, basically. You, you could even see with Lincoln Chafee, like at the Pennsylvania convention, he, he made his, uh, his speech, whatever it was, 15 minutes to address the delegation. He made it a Q&A. He accepted questions. And yeah. you could tell when he got questions, like, oh, shit, they're not going to like this. You could, like, see his body yeah. language change. But he, he still said what he thought. I mean, it wasn't libertarian, but yeah. give him credit for not backing down from it. I always got the sense that he was not bullshitting me, really. I mean, mm-hmm. which is some, more than I could say for one interaction I've had with Bill Weld in my life, where he said, sure, I'd love to uh, go on your show, and pointed me to his, uh, his scheduler and said, just go talk to Joe over there. And then I talked to Joe, and that guy blew me off. It was Joe Jorgensen. Was his it, wasn't, it wasn't that Joe. It was Joe Hunter. Speaking, I'll name speaking names. of all, all these guys, not not Bill Wild, but like Chafee, say Judge Gray. Uh, well, not uh, not Judge Gray. All right. Well, I guess I'm talking about – no, I am. I'm talking about Chafee. I'm talking about Mosh. And I guess we'll talk about Bill Wild. I kind of feel like if somebody just joins the party right before we're having our elections, like I kind of feel like there should be like a – a waiting period or something like you just joined. You're not going to be the figure. It shouldn't be two of, weeks. Of the, of the it should movie. be more than two weeks. Yeah. yeah. At and least Lincoln had changed like, I don't know, eight, nine months prior. I think it was like almost a year before. Like, I think it's kind of like what Roger Paxson says about was it like that the whore can come to church, but she can't be like preaching at the, yeah, something, like that. <laughs> something like that. You can bring the whore to church, but she shouldn't be preaching at the pulpit. No. Yeah, so, and, so if, if uh, Justin Amash, Amash, hopefully he's reelected as libertarian. Oh yeah. I mean, well, he's not going to be reelected as a libertarian. He will re- if he gets reelected, he's technically running on the ballot as an independent if he restarts that campaign, oh, okay. which I think he's going to. But he would still be a libertarian, if that makes sense, because he is a libertarian. Sure. He's coalition. still a member of our party, and he still claims himself to be one. But could he, could he be on the ballot as an independent and a libertarian? I think he could, but hasn't Michigan already had their had their candidate? I don't know. I don't know if Michigan has a libertarian. This is candidate an issue of p- paperwork. I think the ballot's going to stay independent, but he's changed his party yeah. and he's a libertarian. It, ultimately, that's correct. It's a paper. He's running as an independent, but he's a libertarian. I'm just thinking what like Cuomo does in New York. He runs on like seven different lines on the ballot. Well, yeah, New York is weird though. New York does everything but, weird. So Amash, even if he was there this weekend, still running, he still would have been my first pick. He still would have been my second pick. But some people might be surprised. He would have been my third pick. Um, I probably I have, would agree. I mean, I have I have some issues with him, but he is libertarian. He's, I think, the second best congressman in the House that we have. I, I mean, I, I, there are things I disagree with, but I think just his uh, level of notoriety and things he could have done for the party, I wouldn't. I would rather get the eyeballs through Vermin Supreme, and I'd rather have someone with a true message like Jacob Hornberger. But 
I would have been okay with that if it came down to it. I, I didn't like the way he jumped in a couple of weeks beforehand. Had he been running for months, I would have been much more receptive. He would have gotten a lot better reception, and he's still got a pretty good reception. Like I think he would have not won on the first ballot. He would have won in three or four ballots probably if he if he was still running. Uh, I think if he switched from if he just left the Republican Party and went right to Libertarian and was in the party this whole last nine months, it would have been a totally different scenario. But also, I think he left not because of his chances. He could have taken this nomination if he wanted it. He left because he was worried about what became the most contentious part of this convention towards the end was this split convention thing and the possible legalities wherein. Whereas he was concerned, probably rightfully so, to some extent, that the but the split convention, which it's some some... I don't want to get into all the legal details because I don't even know the truth and no one seems to freaking know the truth. Even, even Richard Brown, the, uh, the parliamentarian about how legal this online convention was and if it needs to be ratified by the physical convention later. And I think there was enough uncertainty from him that he said, there's, I'm not going to do this right now if I don't even know yeah. how this is all going to work out. From what I understood, he was afraid that this would, what we did this weekend would just seem like a preference poll. Right. And it was, I mean, honestly, in the way, it was kind of embarrassing the way they tried to run this thing. Like we had a compromise agreement that because of, there were deadlines for the presidential and vice presidential selection to be on the ballots, that even though our bylaws say that we have to meet in person, we have an impossibility clause. Like, well, that's impossible. So we can do this that way. We'll do the rest later. Mm -hmm. Then we show up and it turns out that even though we had this compromise agreement, that the chair and some other people never intended to follow through on that at all. And they wanted but to try to do everything. And it, it became I don't get though. The chair, Nicholas Sarwark, had to know they didn't have the support to do it. I mean, you could tell from the, the polling that the support, because the motion was brought up on day one to add it to the agenda, and it was, it was crushed. So I don't know what he was thinking at the very end where it, with, uh, with what he I tried mean, to the, pull. There were some fear tactics, and he was pulling out some stuff that I don't think was true. Like, oh, well, if, if we adjourn now, then the delegates aren't delegates anymore. And we meet again. It's a whole new convention. He was bringing up a lot of things like, that I, I like can't the, verify the truth, but dude, he, was, he was definitely trying to scare it. everybody out of having the second convention. No, no one's going to take us to court out of that, over that. That's ridiculous. We, to me, it was like the compromise agreement we came to, they, he never intended to stick to it, ever. Well, that became clear because, well, we might as well get to the, the juicy stuff at the end. Uh, towards the end, I'd say about two hours before we finally adjourned, uh, Nick basically stated when there was a motion to adjourn and go to Orlando and just and pick things up then because somebody had tried to um, change the rules, suspend the rules, and start voting on the judicial nominees, and that, which never even ended up really happening at the last – it actually never happened at the last convention. So the, I, think, I forget how the judicial committee was picked afterwards but um that never even happened at, at in 2018 because they never got around to it because there wasn't enough time because nick, nick forgot about it i don't know if he forgot about it. is that what happened i thought he, just didn't Remember, have time. he, he was he was he was taking shots of moonshine on stage i think he just <laughs> forgot it's entirely possible um but i mean yeah he basically just towards the end said like i he, he gave what sounded at first like a, a very conciliatory speech of uh winding down his time and you know being you know happy that he'd been served the chair for three years and then he kind of moved into this speech about interloper, not interlopers, obstructionists, which I think he's referring to Michael Heiss and the Mises Caucus type, type people, yeah. um, who I, I think he's calling an obstructionist anyone who wanted to have the second convention. That's essentially what I'm seeing. Um, I don't really know Nick's motivations, to be honest. There's a lot of people think he's being super devious and has some ulterior motive. I don't know. I mean, he was, be he was definitely using tactics I don't agree with, but I can't see what the end result that would benefit him is other than the fact that maybe he generally doesn't, ha he maybe is like many people I know in real life who are super COVID paranoid and really think it's wrong to have the convention. And I don't think that that's crazy that he could possibly be in that category because I know enough people in real life that are in that category. So, yeah. And you know what? But he maybe he has ul ulterior motives that I don't. He, he posts a lot on Twitter about COVID in ways which makes me think that we really would be putting all these people's lives at risk. It, that could be the case, but there's also the other rumor on the streets is that what they're afraid of is that the people in the Mises caucus, the, the people like a radical caucus aren't afraid of COVID and they will right. show up and take over the party. And then Joshua Smith is the chair and not Joe Bishop Henchman who might have won the chair in this environment. Yes. So that's the, I, so those are the two things. Either he's really mm -hmm. afraid we're putting people's lives in danger or they're just afraid that us young bucks are going to go and take over the party. I like us 40-year-olds. Well, it could be are, both. Are the young it could bucks, be both. I mean, 
We're the same age as Nick. I think he might be younger than me by a year or so. I think he's the same age as me, though. I think he's 38, 39. And COVID so, yeah. doesn't even exist in Florida. I mean, Florida's just been like, <laughs> fuck you, COVID. I honestly think, and it's similar here in Mexico, I, re- I really think there's a lot to the, the temperature thing. I mean, it does seem like there are certain climates mm-hmm. that it, it just isn't, it, not well, that it some, doesn't exist, but it's not, it's not d- devastating people. Someone did say, though, not during the convention, but in some of the comments I saw being typed, um, and I don't, I imagine this won't be true by the time this rolls around, but they were saying that people from New York or Louisiana have to quarantine themselves for 14 days if they come to Florida. Currently, there is some kind of rule in Florida about people yeah. from New York and Louisiana. So I think I that would, was... I would really doubt if by the middle of July, that's still the case. Well, this is well, early even July. If, but... Even if it does happen, I think... Didn't Daniel Hayes say it's built into the plan? Yes. That there's contingencies for those states. Yes. To I, be able I to... would be okay with letting people yeah. from states yeah. with those kind of restrictions participate virtually. Not I'd be okay with letting state. almost anybody participate virtually if they're already seen as delegates if you can communicate your votes to the chair i don't know i'm not not, not saying that confidently but to me i would i would be okay with only if 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 you're in a state where you can't come and do it if legally fine but if you just don't want to go i don't want people that aren't willing to make that effort well to be clear i don't want to go but i will go if i mean that's kind of where i'm at (laughs) it's a lot of work for me to go i have to fly to back to la first because I don't have any suit jackets here or whatever. And then I have to fly to Orlando and then I have to probably maybe fly back to LA and then back to Mexico. Or Wait, why don't you just, uh, Dude, it's probably cheaper to buy a suit in, just like rent. Flor- in Florida than to fly. Indochino, <laughs> Indochino, man. Jason yeah, Stapleton will send you a link. Come will, on. uh, will Lions Liberty buy me an Indochino suit? <laughs> I don't know. Pull the pride. See if they will. <laughs> seems, seems reasonable to me. It's, it's for a company business. I'm just going to start pulling the pride for every, every decision we make after this convention. Just send out the poll. That'll be our decision. Okay, I'll pull. Or, I'll or pull. we'll use election, buddy. <laughs> I mean, at some point, I have to figure out what I'm doing with my life and probably go back. To, I mean, I, I do have an apartment in LA that I'm paying for. I'm just in this position where, um, yeah, whatever. This isn't the Mark's career life hour, but uh, I don't know what's going to happen with my job. I could get called back next week. I could never. I could. I'd be laid off in six months. I have no idea. So I'm kind of in this position where I want to live in this cheaper, nicer place for now but I also don't want to give up my place there yet. So anyway, yeah. we could do a whole pride bonus on my life, my life uh, plans. So were there any other like really notable moments? Well, I, I, we didn't finish going through exactly what happened at the end there. Cause Nick was kind oh, of giving okay. a conciliation speech and then it, it, that changed into talking about the obstructionist, which I think he so, is referring to the Mises caucus. And then he said, and I'm now handing the gavel to Alex Merced and I will not, I will not chair a second convention. So he basically, he did not resign as chair or even technically as the chair of this convention, but he did state clearly he will not chair another convention or a second sitting. And he had the gavel to in, Alex or, in Orlando specifically. He said, I'm not. And he, in said Orlando. He, he said he would chair an online convention tomorrow, though, didn't he? He said something like that. I don't know. I didn't hear that part. I Maybe believe so. Yeah, he, he specifically will not do an in person convention in Orlando, is what he said. Would he do it? So I guess it'll be Alex <laughs> Merced. I guess it's going to be Alex. And God, I mean, God, God bless, bless Alex. God bless Alex. I mean, oh, yeah. he, he didn't know that was happening. I want to buy no. that guy. Not Well, he doesn't drink, but I want to buy him some, whatever eases his pain in life is what I want to buy Alex. Let's get him a steak. That's a, eat me? a steak, a cupcake, a, a CBD pen. <laughs> I have no idea. Alex, if you're listening. I think Alex is actually still a private member. Uh, he is. Uh, if you're listening, Alex. Yeah, I, I want to throw Let, let us know what we can Alex do for you. Because my guy, poor guy. Should we get him a nice gavel for the convention? Not only does he get tossed into the chairmanship role, I mean, he took over a couple of times just to give Nick a break, but this was a chairmanship, this was a, a gavel toss in the most contentious possible situation where suddenly everyone's trying to talk over him. Nick is chiming in completely out of order. I mean, and then Alex probably feels in a position where he, you know, just from where he's used to being, can't override Nick, even though in reality he is now the chair at that point. Um, mm-hmm. And man, I just felt so bad for him. But he handled it with a... With, uh, I would not have handled it as well as Alex did. I probably would have lost my mind. Imagine Brian McWilliams in that role, my friends. Uh, I mean, <laughs> the fact that he never said a bad word about anybody, just said, you know, if I have to go through this, I'd, I'd love to be going through it with all my fellow libertarians. I mean, eh, what a great guy. So, Had a smile on his face said. the whole yeah. time. We should give him a pride he's, refund for the month. He's, he's not, <laughs> he's not the that. most exper- the experienced, uh, you know, parliamentarian or any of that stuff. But he, you know, he took his time. He didn't let the pressure get to him. Yeah, it's hard. Robert Schultz okay, are complicated. It's so, I, I couldn't do it. I mean, I still don't understand the, what the difference is between a point of order and a point of whatever. And I'm, I, 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 I've I just know I'm never going to care about it. So I don't even bother to learn. I just want to, I don't like it. <laughs> we should do Howie's rules of order. 
Mm, I'd rather like a Masonic Lodge, though. I don't think we'd want Nick to have the same power that the head of the lodge has. Wait, what do you guys use in the Masonic Lodge? Sodomy to any of the members. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's <laughs> like the master has a lot more authority. You know, if somebody makes a motion, there, there's no second. It's either the master decides to take it up or he decides not to. There's no tabling things for later. If the master wants to deal with it, he will. If he doesn't, we won't. Um, I don't know, like what kind of, oh, I, I think when they try to appeal the ruling of the chair, there's no appealing the ruling of the master. The, what he says pretty much goes. I mean, you could maybe later go to the district deputy grandmaster, the grandmaster, if you feel like they're really violating some part of Masonic law. But oh, One thing that, that was interesting is I know on, uh, on Friday night, uh, Josh Smith was posting that he could have done X or Y to make things go faster, which I don't understand. Um, but I don't know, would Nick have had like an incentive to draw that out more? I, I, I don't Nick know. never seemed like he was having a fun time to me. I, mean, I, I, yeah. I think he wanted to get his way. I don't think he wanted things to be dr- drawn out necessarily. He hey, hey, can, what he wanted, which is the whole convention. Can the thumbnail for this episode be that, that picture of him? <laughs> can someone send me the best <laughs> you know version? About? Every version I've seen has, has words over it. I think I might have one. Or if we get, get Brian doing the same gesture. That would I'll be, send it to you. If you could send us a screenshot, that would be great. I'll look for that. You guys talk. All right. Well, what else do we have to talk about? I think we've, we've pretty much... Well, the, the end of the day, the end of the, uh, the situation was the, the, the body did move to adjourn until Orlando on July 9th. So officially, as of now... Well, not officially because the chair has to sign a contract. So I think, I mean, I'm not going to go booking any plane tickets or trying to fly to LA or buy an Indochino suit or whatever I'm going to do until we have an actual signed contract for a convention. But the chair, has, has the chair resigned? No, Nick is the chair of the no. party. So still the chair has to, he, but, just, he just gave over the gavel for this meeting. He, he won't be presiding you, in Orlando, but he's still but the you chair. Can't, so, so this is a problem. You can't, he's, so he can it's hold the party hostage. In a sense, but then the LNC yeah. could vote to override him or something, or vote suppose, to remove yeah. him. I suppose. I mean, I it, don't know. It'll be it'll be Alex running it in Orlando, for sure. But I'm talking about in yeah. terms of signing the contract yeah, to get exactly. us to Orlando. Oh, uh, because okay. the chair still needs to sign that contract. He was acting like he did today, so I guess we'll see. I mean, how how could he be so opposed to it happening and sign the contract? I mean, if he really thinks it's for everybody's you know health and lives, I, I he shouldn't sign the contract if he if, if that's yeah. what he believes. If he thought he was going to not do it and he signed the contract, he was throwing over $100,000 away. I still think he's going to show up and chair the convention. Really? I do. You think he's just bluffing? I don't, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but I think there's more to it. There's something else to it. I, I know that he's, he's concerned with COVID, but he does not want Josh Smith to, uh, to get the chairmanship. No, he wants the right word, uh, uh, Bishop Henchman do to get it. Because yeah. th- there's been some things that have leaked out. That Nick has said some things about Josh Smith about he wanted him to fail in his LNC role, and well, they're obviously uh, not buddies. So, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty obvious. Told, there was a uh, a Facebook Live or maybe it was a podcast. Um, what is it called? Drunk and disorderly. Um, where John Phillips was on with another LNC person, and John Phillips was just just going off on uh, Nick on uh, Nick Sawark, and, and he's usually quite reserved about. And he was he was like apologizing that. for holding you know for holding it in before and not saying this earlier, but you know things have come out that really they were trying to sabotage sabotage Josh um, as an LNC member. So I, I don't know. It's as a, a member, a not just as a candidate. On. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. So he, so he wouldn't oh. be successful in, in his role. Well, the plot thickens. I try to t- yeah. not take sides on LNC stuff. I mean, there's people I like. I like I like the spirit of the Mises Caucus. I've never called myself a member. I, I like a lot of what they're doing, but I don't want to, you know, I just don't want to associate with any sides. That's, I like to look at things neutrally as, yeah, as neutrally as I can. I respect all, all, all sorts of libertarians, even pragmatist libertarians. Like, if you're a pragmatist minarchist, like, I'm not going to, make you an enemy of mine like you know we're all sort of on that same team um so i, I like to stay friends yeah. with everybody and you know i can't say i'm unhappy about the ticket at the end of the day and in in, in in with 24 hours to kind of sit on it especially because spike uh spike got it and that really i think i think we have the most sort of united i don't i can't remember the last time we've seen a sort of split ticket in the sense um where where joe is i guess the pragmatist pick um but the most libertarian pragmatist pick we've seen in a long time or maybe ever and then with this 
you know, anarchist, really cool, hip sort of young guy who can bring people in. Uh, it's a really, it's a really great combination. I think even the combination with Mons would have been decent. I was not uh, upset about Mons if he won it all. Um, no offense to Mr. Good. Armstrong. I really he didn't interest me as the VP candidate. Good guy. Seems like a great guy. Didn't do it for me, but I, I would have been totally okay with Mont or Spike, even though I will say I voted for Spike every round. Cause I, I just think he brings so much more to the table. If Spike is ever does get to have a debate with Mike Pence, I really hope he doesn't wear a shirt. <laughs> that will never happen. But if it does, I agree. <laughs> All right. Well, do we have any more to talk about? I think we've covered, covered, uh, covered our bases here, friends. Should we do a bonus segment? Should we do a, a, a 10 know, minutes? It's about time really for dinner here. Really yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm about ready to, I was yeah. up with these people through the kind of lengthy, uh, deliberative process that we went through all weekend. All right. Well, let's wrap things up. I suppose maybe we can do a five minute bonus about what we're going to have for dinner and then, and then okay. call things up just to give the sure. pride something. Uh, but the pride already got a live stream of me on, on slightly delayed video, but I guess perfectly fine audio because that's uh, as far as I'm getting now in Mexico apparently. Uh, but we put in over, I think what 30 something hours on this, on these zoom calls in these, these three days of the LNC. Um, I think we deserve the drinks we're having and we deserve to stop podcasting and go drink more and stop being in front of I computers. Agree. So I'm going to reward ourselves with that right now. Second. And uh, second the motion. Uh, are there any objections at all? No, no objections. None. Great. From the third member of the, of the body. Uh, with that being said, it seems we have more than a two-thirds majority required to end this program. <laughs> uh, so, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, do stay tuned in to Electric Liberty Land on Wednesday because I know Brian has a lot to get off his chest about this. And uh, apparently he made plans for the two hours that we ended up doing uh, the show today. Who has plans in Los Angeles? Uh, when you're not allowed to do anything? That's the question. I'd love to know what kind of laws are being broken right now by Brian. Uh, but I'm sure he's going to be spouting off on Electric Liberty Land. And uh, John, what, what, since you're here, why don't you tell us what's going to happen on Felony Friday? Anything? Any plans? Fe- well, Felony Friday this week will be show, right? bringing uh, Lynn Ulbricht back on the show. Oh. And uh, it's uh, our Pride member. It's his uh, Tyler Colford. It's his show to uh, produce. Awesome. Um, he's a, at the nitty level. So uh, when you're at that level, you get to produce a show and uh, he wants to... A mere 50 produce- bucks a month, you can become yeah. essentially a producer of one episode of this program. Exactly. And he, he's, he has a song, a song uh, about Ross Ulbricht and the injustice and uh, we promote... A song that, that so. they already heard an ad in this program earlier today Very that I'll true. later insert through editing. There you go. <laughs> All right, well, that being said, tune in to all of our shows, the whole lineup, and all of our bonus shows if you join the Pride, which you can join at patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty with the knowledge that 10% of that money will go to our great friends at DonorC and the awesome work they're doing to help people affected around the world by uh, coronavirus and all the lockdowns. Until next time, my friends, I am going to go drink my damn face off because we have freaking earned it. And until next time, of course, live long and, and live free. free.